Carla. So I, I uh, think we should give Andreas a round of applause. And Andreas has really done the lion's share of all the work and the coordination, and, and you can really um, thank him for most of what we're going to benefit from this week. And we'll mention it again later on. So what I thought I would do is do a little kickoff talk um, talking about um, dynamical downscaling at convective permitting scales. And I'm just going to take a second here and put on the microphone. Can you hear me OK? OK. So one of the questions that I get when, uh, whenever I talk to folks who are um, wondering about what we're doing with convective permitting scales is, is it really worth it? I mean, why can't we just use statistical downscaling or some other hybrid methodology? And so uh, I decided to put together a talk. I presented this, uh, most of this talk at a workshop in Japan um, last year. And uh, it was uh, well received, so I thought it would be worth uh, showing this again. I also wanted to mention that uh, Paul Dermeyer is sitting in the back there. Raise your hand, Paul. He gave a seminar uh, today in this room, 11 to 12. And it was a, a great introduction, actually, to what we're doing here. Uh, he talked about convective parameterizations and the need to link the land surface modeling community to the atmospheric science community. And I think that's a very exciting area that we can play a major role. And uh, we'll talk more about this during the workshop. We have a whole land surface modeling um, section of our, of our uh, workshop that uh, Fei Chen is leading. And I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit more. So when I look at uh, the way WARF does its uh, parameterizations, I, you, we see mainly five different uh, parameterizations that interact. One is cumulus parameterization, microphysics, radiation, PBL, and surface. And what we, we gain largely when we go to convective permitting is we don't need, when we haven't used the cumulus parameterizations as much. So we have less emphasis on the cumulus parameterization and actually more on the microphysics and the PBL and the, and the land surface. So if you look at this as in, a, in a scale type of framework, uh, as we go from global to regional, where we spend, have spent most of our time, we've, in, it's involved microphysical parameterizations, cumulus parameterizations, PBL, and radiation. However, as we move to finer and finer scales, we're able to uh, drop the cumulus parameterization. And this community has shown that um, we don't need to parameterize cumulus clouds as much as we used to because we're starting to resolve them. So the convective permitting scales start coming in. However, we get into this gray zone. Uh, we'd really like to be at one kilometer at, at least for convective uh, simulations. However, we're, we're kind of stuck here at around four to three kilometers just because of computer speed. And that's where we spend most of our time in, in my group. And we've, we've gotten a lot of benefit from uh, being in that, that scale regime. So today, we're going to be where that, the blue star is located. But uh, we have to keep in mind where we came from. And uh, how do we uh, continue the interaction? So what I don't show here is the interaction between the, uh, these uh, par parameterizations. And I think that's where we're at now, is how do these uh, PBL scheme interact with the land surface, interact with the microphysics, et cetera. I think that coupling problem, and Paul brought that out beautifully in his seminar uh, this morning. If some of you didn't see his talk, at, it's online, and uh, you can look at it uh, later on. So we've gone to the uh, convective permitting scale. This is a movie over the CONUS of the US is one month movie. And you can see a lot of the, the features that you, you know, cold fronts and you know, extratropical cyclones, you'll see a hurricane coming up down here, uh, tend to be resolved. You can see these outflows. Here's a hurricane that's spinning up and goes up the, the, the coast here. Uh, this is from Ethan Gutman. Ethan has a great paper looking at 29 hurricanes in convective permitting mode and how would they look like in a future climate. But 
this is some of the type of, uh, of uh, resolutions that we're getting when we go into convective permitting. And uh, it generates lots of data, but it also gives us the opportunity to look at uh, questions like um, intensity, frequency, duration, and uh, phase of precipitation. So one of the challenges that we've had in our water cycle program here at NCAR is getting this right. Uh, the climate models, as I'll show you, tend to uh, underestimate intensity and overestimate frequency of precipitation. How do we overcome this problem? And that's part of what I'm going to talk about here in the next few minutes. And of course, all of this has implications for soil moisture, which Paul Tall talked a lot about. I think that's one of the, the benefits of getting these uh, intensity durations correct, is getting the right soil moisture, a runoff and surface hydrology as, as well. Um, so we don't have uh, computers that can run uh, global models uh, for um, 100 years, which that's what we do now. So uh, right now we we're down at say 50 kilometers, 100 kilometers, um, and we need to use convective parameterizations. So the question I've been wrestling with the last 10 years or so is can we develop a convective parameterization to get the right intensity frequency? And if not, is there a way to do this with statistical or hybrid downscaling? Do we need to go to full dynamical downscaling? A uh, related question here is that global models all use uh, convective parameterizations. And so if we're getting the intensity and frequency wrong, are they proper boundary conditions for uh, downscale regional uh, models? And the bottom line question here in my mind is, do we need to global, go to global convective permitting modeling? So one way that we've looked at the, the intensity, duration, frequency is by looking at the diurnal cycle of precipitation, especially warm season over the United States. The nice thing about the United States, we have lots of observations. And it turns out that the main um, uh, storm system that produces precipitation in the central US are these MCSs that typically form right over the Rocky Mountains right here. And uh, they propagate to the east. And then they produce the, the classic midnight convection over uh, Kansas and Iowa. And they have a uh, mesoscale structure. They have a downdraft. They have updraft, et cetera. And Mitch Moncrief has done a great job um, describing these from a theoretical point of view. This is some work by uh, Rick Carbone's group looking at the next red radar data. Oops. Um, this is a movie loop which shows which isn't working at the moment, but it shows convection starting here and then moving to the east. And the summary of this is this diagram that uh, Jason Knievel put together in the paper in 2004, which shows this midnight maximum. So you can see where things are originating over the, uh, over the Rocky Mountains regions here, and then they move to the east, and then you get this midnight max. So I go die, and Kevin Trembert did some uh, studies in uh, 2004 showing that the, uh, the, the uh, global climate models at that time did not reproduce this midnight maximum. You can see this is the timing. Yellow means basically noon maximum. And here you can see the midnight maximum. Um, I go continued that work in um, 2006. This, the top diagram, top two panels are from the TRIM satellite and the lower panels are from various GCMs. And the, the take home message here is that the, the intensity is underestimated and the frequency is overestimated. And uh, not to uh, let Graham off the hook here, he did a paper in 2010 who showed a similar thing using the CloudSat data. Uh, I love the title of his talk, of his paper, Dreary State of Precipitation in Global Models. And this really got us going as well, because these, these MCSs are major, major systems. They produce 60 70% of the precipitation in the lee of the mountains here in, in the US. Also happens in South America. There's a big uh, field program in South America, Relampago, that's going to happen this, uh, this winter. 
looking at the same types of systems that produce precipitation. You can see globally, uh, this, these are important types of uh, precipitation systems. And yet, in our, our climate models, what we have is, is a simple 1D cloud model. When I took cloud physics at UCLA, this was the first cloud model I learned about. And I never thought that this would be the model that's used in global climate models. It's a very simple and training uh, plume model. Whereas in reality, we have these MCS systems that have mesoscale structure. So this is what we're trying to capture. And this is what we actually have. So I think with convective permitting, it allows us, uh, at least at a scale is less than about four kilometers, to capture some of these mesoscale uh, dynamics that are important to the precipitation that we uh, observe. And this is uh, now moving to our talk by Andreas Prine, looking at the, the Hurricane Harvey precipitation from, uh, from the Houston area. This is one of the reasons why we need to get this right. If we're going to be able to simulate in a future climate the impact of hurricanes, uh, we're going to need to get the convection and the MCS structures correct. So this got us going on a, a conus-wide simulation. At four kilometer resolution, we did this for 13 years, and we forced it on the boundaries with era interim. The, uh, the various boundary uh, parameterizations are listed here. As you can see, we, there is no convective parameterization. So we're running this without a convective parameterization. Uh, we did use uh, spectral nudging above the boundary layer to nudge the large scale flow to be correct, so we can compare the observations. And this is in a paper by Cheng Hai Lu in uh, 2016 in climate dynamics. So here's a, a, a movie. Uh, and on the one of them is radar data. And one of them is from the model. So which one, which one is, is model? Left or right? Anybody? How many think the left is the model? How many think the right is the model? OK. <laughs> Somebody's paying attention. <laughs> you're right. So if you're paying attention, you'll see the model takes convection off the coast here, as the radar does not. But uh, what's impressive here is how well the two simulations or the two data sets agree. Uh, the model is doing a really, really good job on these mesoscale structures. So to, to further look into that, Andreas did a really nice objective analysis of the model output and compared it to the observations. And uh, this is in a paper in Nature Climate Change. And if you're interested, talk to Andreas after the fact. Uh, he used this new um, uh, method for object-based analysis called MODE. This is uh, work done in RAL by Randy Bullock uh, and the JNT Mike Eck. I don't know if Mike is here or not. But this is really a great, uh, great tool. It allows you to do time and space. So it integrates the, the motion here on space, but it also does the time domain. So if you look at this structure, you can then compare the, the object that's produced by the space and time. And you can see in this particular case, of course, it did a very, very nice job. But in general, it does, it does do a really nice job. And what I'm going to do next, this is what Andreas did. He looked at uh, the speed, lifetime, size, maximum intensity, and total precipitation from these MCSs. And we're looking at June, July, August, central US. Here's the domain. Black is observations, and red is model. First time he showed me this uh, diagram, I said, where's, where's the data? Where's the model? It just looks red to me. And uh, the, the two lines are almost on top of each other. And this is the MCS lifetime going out to uh, 30 hours. You can see a little bit of a discrepancy down here. But in general, the lifetime comparison is amazing. Uh, what about precipitation volume? Uh, same type of uh, analysis. He's got some spread in the data here in the light pink. Um, very nice. Maximum precipitation, again. Really nice comparison between observations and the model. And the speed of the MCSs is also well captured. Um, very impressive, and the size as well. However, if you look, looked at this carefully, you can see that the frequency 
is a little uh, too low in the model compared to the observations. He's normalized it here. So if you look at the actual MCSs per year over the 13 years of our simulation, it looks something like this, um, about 20 per year, Ju July and August. If you look at the simulation, you see that May and June agree very well. But once we get to uh, July and August, we can see a, a significant drop off. So this is an area that we need to improve in our convective permitting modelings. We need to capture how, how these MCSs are actually initialized. Uh, what we're finding is that this is associated with a warm, dry bias over the central US. And uh, Paul mentioned that in his talk uh, this morning as well. This is a known, well-known deficiency in many forecasts and climate models. So we've had a group of scientists here at NCAR working on this problem. And Mike Bolage is going to report on some of the results tomorrow in his keynote. So I won't steal his thunder, so I'll just move on. And oops, sorry. I'll skip this slide in the interest of time. And uh, this looks at, remember I started off by talking about the diurnal cycle. Um, this is a diurnal cycle that has an afternoon peak. This one has a noon peak. This is what a lot of climate models do today. As soon as it gets to noon, it starts, it's, it's irregardless of the latent heat and the soil moisture. Paul pointed that out this morning. And then the nighttime peak, which is what I've been talking about today. This is what we tend to see in the US. What do the observations show? I already showed this. Uh, blue is the midnight maximum over the central US. Over the uh, east coast, we tend to get an afternoon maximum in red. So you can see these colors are coded according to, to the uh, cycle. Uh, wharf th 36 kilometers tends to have everything uh, right around noon. So this is with a convective parameterization. Now, if we, just, if we turn off the convective parameterization and run wharf of 4 kilometers, we can see that we're getting the uh, timing of the diurnal cycle much better with the midnight max here and the, the noon convection um, on the east coast. So this is a really good, good result, a really nice result. And when I first saw this, I, I asked Andreas right away, so what about uh, convection over the mountains, uh, western US? So he said, this, we get similar results. Um, this is a wharf 36 kilometers over the western US. You can see it's, it's the pink purple region here. And uh, the mo three different convective parameterizations show the amount here. You can see we're overestimating the amount. We're overestimating the frequency. And we're uh, underestimating the intensity when we use the three convective parameterizations compared to the observations which are shown here. But when we use four kilometer wharf, we're getting uh, very close to the correct amount. Uh, frequency is a little bit too high, but not bad, much better than the convective permitting. And uh, intensity is a bit low, uh, but overall, it, it does a really good job, even outside of the MCS world. So this is also exciting to me, because I feel like we're now going to be able to apply this type of framework for a future MCS. And Andreas uh, did that. Um, we did a, a simple uh, pseudo-global warming type approach, where we, we added monthly perturbations of uh, the uh, 19 CMIP5 GCM. So essentially, it's warmer moisture uh, inside here. The weather is similar to what it was in the current climate run, 76 to 2005. So we've added these uh, monthly perturbations. And we're looking largely at the thermodynamic response here. And so this is a particular uh, climate change scenario, or bad word scenario. Uh, realization is a better way to say it. And what Andreas has done here is these tracks and intensities. So these are the tracks of the MCSs in the current. And this is in the future. You can immediately see that there's more MCSs in the future climate. And if we just focus in on uh, the northeast here, this blue, blue square, you can see that. Uh, oh you can see that there's a, uh, definitely a lot more MCSs in, the, in this northeast region compared to what it was in the current climate. 
And if you look at the volume and size of the storms, this is now the frequency difference between storms. You can see there's a lot more storms. And th these storms uh, did not occur in the current climate. These are storms that are off scale. I don't know if they're black swans or whatever, but they're much stronger than anything we've seen to date. And this has implications for things like Hurricane Harvey, which uh, are tending to be very slow moving, have tremendous amounts of precipitation. So what we see is in precipitation going up. Um, and the speed, interestingly enough, is staying about the same. Again, we're getting these, these storms with the large volume that we never had before. Um, if we look at the top 40 extreme MCSs in the current climate, uh, the, basically this is a composite study that looked like this. And if we do a composite of the future climate, you can see they get bigger and more precipitation. So there's, uh, the maximum has gone up by about 30%. And if you look at the precipitation area compared to the precip intensity, the future MCSs are uh, significantly um, higher uh, area and uh, intensity, and the volume has increased uh, on the order of 60% for this particular uh, area and amount. So this gives you just a flavor for the kind of uh, future climate studies that we can do. Uh, Andreas produced this nice graphic where we look at what the current rain volume is and say rain rate is, the current rain volume is rain rate times rain area times the speed. So in the future, we, we saw the speed didn't change that much, but the rain area increased by 20 to 70 percent, and the rain rate increased 15 to 80 percent. So this gives us 30 to 80 percent change, which is very similar to what we saw in, in Hurricane Harvey and something that we may see in the future. But this gives us a little more confidence that this, in fact, is what's happening. So to conclude my talk, uh, can statistical or hybrid downscaling capture this behavior? Uh, not really. Um, statistical correlates really with the GCM large scale fields. Uh, GCM uses the 1D simple cloud parameterization that really doesn't capture the, the MCS type storms. Um, the diurnal cycle of convection is not captured, nor is the intensity or the frequency, especially over the United States. It would be interesting to look at this over other regions of the world. Uh, Peter Van Ovalen is going to talk about food baskets in, in other regions like the Andes, and it would be really fascinating to look at the same problem in other regions. Uh, winter precipitation tends to be better handled by statistical downscaling, but summer convection is poorly handled. And uh, I already mentioned this result. So can statistical or hybrid downscaling capture this effect? Um, Ethan Gutman has produced a, a, a really cool um, hybrid model called ICAR. And it uses a linear solution of the flow field driven by the GCM large scale variables. Uh, we've shown that it works uh, fairly well for the uh, for orographic type precipitation. It runs 100 times faster. Um, but it does have a little bit of limitation is that it's linear flow, so if there's block flow, it won't capture it. The current weakness is convection. And as I showed you in this talk, convection is one of the key things. So this is an area that I like to challenge this community. If we can do something like ICAR with convection, then that could really make a big difference and allow us to do a lot more uh, climate runs. Can regional modeling capture this? Um, I think the answer, as you've already seen, is uh, is probably not. Um, it depends on how well, you, how good your convective parameterization is. For instance, if you're interested in hurricanes, um, it depends on the convective parameterization. And uh, we've done uh, Cindy Bier's group at MQ has done some interesting simulations with uh, one, two, three different convective parameterizations, and these are tracks of the storms that were produced um, at 36 kilometers. And uh, I think this was over a 10-year period. And you can see, depending on the convective parameterization, you get very different initialization of hurricanes. So if you're going to try to do this in a future climate, you, I mean, it's very, very difficult to believe that you're going to be able to capture this with convective parameterization. And so this is one of the primary reasons why I think we need to go to convective permitting. I think Ethan's paper has shown this very nicely. And I will just end with this movie and take any questions.
Thank you very much.